we're going to do in this first video is take a little introduction to the role and the um, the leaders of the Conservative governments in what was known as the Affluent Society. So we're talking about post-war Britain, okay, we're talking about the 1950s, and we're going to talk about the, the power that the Conservatives had from 1951 all the way until they lost control in, in 1964. Now the idea of an affluent society um, marks a a period of post-war economics okay the, the 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 term itself affluent society comes from an american economist and so really this is a period in history of relative social um ease and relative economic success uh, a post-war economic boom and so we're going to talk about in this lesson the role of the conservative governments in the affluent society the sort of general domestic policies and then in the next few lessons we're going to start to delve into the 1950s and the 1960s uh, the conservative governments in that period and look at their foreign policy their e economics in more detail uh, the societal issues and so on and so forth so as an introduction to the political leaders as i've already mentioned the affluent uh, sorry the conservative party took control uh, following the end of the Second World War, so they were voted out. Uh, so they were so they were voted out of power at the end of the Second World War, and the Labour government, led by Clement Attlee, took over, and then they retook power in 1951 and remained in control from 1951 all the way up to 1964. So that was the period of time in which we're talking about here. And of that, in that period of time, there were four leaders of the Conservative Party. So we have Winston Churchill, we have Anthony Eden, we have Harold Macmillan, and we also have Alec Douglas Hume. So first of all, Anthony, uh, sorry, first of all, Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister from 1951 to 1955. Don't forget he was also the famous wartime Prime Minister who uh, took over power uh, during the Second World War. And he's partially credited for the Allied victory in World War Two. So uh, one thing that Winston Churchill is remembered for for day uh, today is his um, wartime policies. So his wartime leadership, should we say? He's less remembered now for his policies in the 1950s, from 51 to 55. He was 77 years old when he took reclaimed power in 1951. Some argued that. You know he was too old to be prime minister, and this does go to show in the um, in the in the few years that he remained prime minister from 1951 to 1955, as he was often a sickly leader. Okay, he often you know fell ill, and this was in part due to his old age. Anthony Eden was prime minister from 1955 to 1957. Okay, he had served as the foreign secretary and took over from Winston Churchill when Winston Churchill resigned in 1955. Okay, and Anthony Eden has a uh, relatively controversial um, time as prime minister because he is um, responsible for the Suez Crisis in 1956, where uh, the Suez Canal was lost. And this was partially responsible for, and partially the reason for his resignation in uh, in 1957. And the party was then taken over by Harold Macmillan, who was Prime Minister from 1957 to 1963. Uh, don't forget, by the way, this is just a, a brief overview of each of the leaders and the policies in this lesson. We're going to go into a lot more detail. So if you feel like that there's not enough information here on these on these uh, various different leaders, don't worry, we are actually going to go into a lot of detail on these um, on this period. And then finally, we've got Alex uh, Alec Douglas Home, who was uh, Prime Minister from 1963 to 1964. Okay, and what should be really said that historians argue um, with uh, Douglas Home is that he didn't really have time to implement any kind of policy since he was defeated in October 1964. So effectively, he wasn't really in power for very long. So he wasn't he wasn't in power long enough. Wasn't in power long enough. Which is one of the you know criticisms, shall we say, of of home. 
moving on now, let's have a look at the general, uh, the, the broad overview of the domestic policies that took place between 1951 and 1964, okay? So despite the fact that the Conservatives had control between uh, 51 and 64, there was generally a, a broad agreement between the parties, the main parties, okay? So we, we have what was, you know, generally known as bipartisan support. So we have generally bipartisan partisan support, which is something that is, you know, <laughs> very rare in today's in today's politics. So effectively both sides of the House of Commons agreed on the kind of things that they wanted to achieve for the for the war. Uh, sorry, for the uh, post war period. And this was known as the post war consensus. Uh, the post war consensus consisted of a number of policies and these are a number of policy agreements so people uh, people's agreeing on you know a broad agreement broad popularity across uh, all the different political spectrum so there was a broad support for a british welfare state for not just you know a support and bolstering of the british welfare state but also an expansion of the uh, welfare state okay and you know the importance of the NHS, which was only introduced in the forties under Clement Attlee, and the support quote from cradle to grave when it came was the was the kind of um, political message around the NHS in this in this period. There was also uh, support for government intervention in the economy to ensure maximum growth. Okay, we'll talk about this when we look at the economy of uh, of the Conservative period in the fifties and sixties. There was also a foreign policy consensus on supporting the USA in opposition to the USSR and communism. So, don't forget that uh, you know the foreign policy um, period in in the six fifties and sixties is just as important as the domestic policies because we are at the uh, the height. We are at the height. Uh, we're at the height of the Cold War. Of the Cold War. Don't forget, in, in the USA, we have Presidents Eisenhower, then Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon and you know Ford, uh, Carter, and so on and so on. I could go all the way. But we have the height of the Cold War at this period of time, and so therefore we have US um, support, uh, support for the USA uh, in the Cold War. And there was also a broad consensus on independence for colonies. This was the period uh, of the, the final breakup, so the final breakup of the British Empire. So the final breakup of the British Empire. So, so really, with things like the Suez Crisis in 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 six in the sixties, uh, we see the final, the last bastions of of colonialism, uh, colonialism. Uh, and imperialism from the British Empire starting to to fade and and break away, and the the breakup and and eventual decline of the British Empire is something that took place over a a very long period of time. However, it was in this period of time, in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies, that we start to see the the final collapse of all the the remaining areas of 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 the empire. And this is an image of Anthony Eden, by the way. We've got. Winston Churchill here uh, 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 at the at the victory of in World War One, uh, sorry World War Two, and we also have Winston Churchill here, you know, a portrait image, and then we also have Anthony Eden. So, what really were the reasons why the Conservatives were successful in this period of time? And we're going to look at why the reasons uh, the reasons for Conservative success, and then we're also going to look at the reasons why the Labour governments and the Labour Party was, um, you know, were, failed effectively was, you know, was so unpopular. So there are a number of reasons why the the party was successful in this period. So it should generally be said that the the economic policies were broadly successful. There was a low unemployment and there was an increase in the standard of living. Okay, and this uh, you know the the extent to which this is tied into a, a post war boom, uh, a post war economic um, uh, growth. Uh, is you know is obviously a hotly debated topic. However, it, you know it should be noted that this affluent society did come uh, uh, almost immediately following this, the end of the Second World War. The Conservatives were also associated with the new Elizabethan age. Uh, 
with Queen Elizabeth becoming uh, queen, being crowned in 1953. So the Conservative Party took over power in 1951. And so there is a connection here, a link between the this new Elizabethan age and and this new age of conservatism. Britain was still a world power. So this was something that was very interesting. Don't forget that now we are going into a new era of uh, humanity. That you know we have the atomic era now. So the first you know atomic weapons were developed by the United States and used against Japan in 1945, and since then you have the development of nuclear nuclear weapons. And in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, Britain was, uh, you know, owned the nuclear weapons, the USSR, uh, the USA, I believe France at the time owned nuclear weapons as well. So we were uh, among a very small number of, of, of world powers, of, of, of countries that, that had the uh, nuclear technology. More domestically, uh, the improvement in the housing market did lead to 300,000 new helm homes being built per year under Churchill. Again, this ties into economic success. So we're tying this in, ties into uh, economic success. Economic success. Uh, we also have, um, <clears throat> we also have uh, new, uh, 6,000 new hel homes being built. Okay. And we also have the first motorways. So uh, part of the M1 was built in 1959. Again, this was also seen as a link to the conservative governments, and so links, uh, links to conservative governments. Conservative governments. So, I mean, at the time we take the idea of a motorway for granted. Uh, well, you know, as we live in society today. But however, at the time uh, when the M1 was built, it was genuinely seen as a a, a new and and quite large development in in. Um, in prosperity effectively and not just the fact that they were conservative successes but there were also uh, reasons why the Labour Party were very unsuccessful during this period of time okay so it, it was the increased support for the Conservatives wasn't just uh, you know a positive aspect the the positive um, policies that were introduced by the Conservatives but also negative aspects of the Labour Party so in the 1950s, the Labour Party was effectively split. So there was a division over the extent and support of defence spending. Okay, there was also huge opposition to the development of nuclear nuclear weapons. So these were um, oppositions to the Conservative Party uh, on these on these issues, but also within the government, it's within Labour Party itself. So within the Labour Party itself, Labour Party itself we see these um we see these uh, you know divisions and, and different ideas and the split that took place and when you've got a, a party that is split on on issues that are so um so controversial and, and so important like you know the development of nuclear weapons in the 1950s and 60s then it's very hard for that party to to show a united front and take over power okay uh, the leader uh, Hugh Gateskill uh, suddenly died in 1963. So again, this was, uh, you know, um, pushed the Labour Party into a bit more turmoil. And also, you know, because of this idea of a post-war consensus and, and post-war prosperity, and uh, again, uh, tying back into the idea of the affluent society, affluent society, people didn't want this period to end, okay? They had gone from the Second World War, or and then into the the uh, you know a few years later the the uh, the you know the building up of the economy, the rebuilding of the economy, and the the post war consensus. We see that people didn't want to see an end to this. They wanted to carry on this. They wanted to see it carrying on uh, this you know this post war consensus, and so. Therefore, they didn't really want to vote out the Conservative Party and vote in a different um, a different government, and so therefore they carried on voting for the same party, and that's why the Conservative government held power for so long, and through so many different leaders. So in the next lesson, we're going to look specifically at the economy.
and then we're going to start to look at other issues of society and foreign policy before we move on past the Conservative government and look at the subsequent Labour government that took over uh, after, uh, sorry, in 1964. So as we start to look and analyse the Conservative policies and the Conservative government within the 50s and, and the 60s, the early 60s, we're going to start by looking at how they fell from power, okay, and the reasons for the Conservative decline. Because we talked in the last lesson about the this this new consensus that was that had developed following the um, the retaking of power by the Conservatives under Winston Churchill, uh, following Clement Attlee's decline, and so now what we're going to do is talk about the reasons why they began to decline themselves. So the Conservative government won its third general election in 1959. Okay, and this would be the last general election for a long time that it would win. And it was by this point that the Conservative government was beginning to look a little bit out of touch. And one of the reasons for this was because there was, you know, there was a, a, a very little representation between women and young people in government. It was just generally seen as uh, old men. And generally, you know, that doesn't represent Britain. You know, that this is a problem that uh, exists in politics in, across the world, even today. The, the fact that you know a very small mind, a very small group of people are represented in most of government however there were also a number of conservative scandals that took place within this period of time okay so for firstly there was a number of figures which had been caught spying for the soviet union don't forget this was the height of the cold war okay we're starting to go in, get into the height of the cold war so we're starting to see cold war like attitudes begin to exist and you know lead in the late 50s early 60s and into the 70s we start to see cold war the, the cold war really you know heat up almost and the number of figures who had been caught spying for the soviet union all all these policies uh, or you know all these scandals sorry uh, accumulated in the vassal affair where kim philby who was an MI6 agent, fled to the Soviet Union in 1963. This was, you know, this reflected badly on the on the conservative government, who were uh, relatively hostile to the Soviet Union. There was also the Night of the Long Knives, uh, not to be confused with the Night of the Long Knives that happened in Germany at the, uh, before the first, sorry, before the Second World War. This was a Night of the Long Knives that took place in 1962. And this is where Macmillan purged most of his cabinet in an effort to uh, introduce younger figures. Okay, and the aim here was to try and look more representable, more representative. Okay, he wanted he you know he heeded the the criticisms of of this conservative government being. Um, not very representative of a new of the new Britain. So in one night, he decided to cur uh, to purge his cabinet and introduce younger figures. However, rather than looking like you know, oh wow, this 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 party, this government is is representing the younger voters, it just looked like a, a, a chaotic um, and you know unbridled mess that took place within the cabinet, which is why we have it, and it's called the Night of the Long Knife. We also have in 1963 the Profumo affair, and this was where the Minister of War John Profumo was involved in a sex scandal with a with a younger woman, and the implication uh, this implicated a number of high-ranking government figures, and again this looked bad on the government because you know this was a scandal that took place within uh, one of the one of the cabinet's very senior ministers, the Minister for War. And then finally, in 1963, uh, Macmillan retired from government and was replaced by Sir Alec Douglas Home. However, Douglas Home was, you know, unable to really establish himself as, as a leader before the election was called and before he lost. And so this is really the, how the downfall uh, took place within the conservative, uh, within the Sir conservative government. There was also two other... Um, kind of factors that took place when we talk about the Conservatives fall from power. One was the impact of satire and two was the replacement of Macmillan. We're going to talk about these individually. So the impact of satire. 
Following the Second World War, we can sort of see that in, in society there's a general respect for government. And this this is reflect this reflects the kind of patriotism the patriotism that existed, you know, across most of the world at this time. Because, you know, the these were Britain was one of the main allies leading to the victory in the, the the biggest and most destructive war in human history. So of course there is a, a certain sense of patriotism that took place. However, this kind of, you know, this kind of patriotic and general respect for government and respect for political figures began to, you know, wear off uh, in the 50s and 60s. And this culminated in, in university students setting up um, satirical reviews such as Beyond the Fringe, which attacked the government. And we also have, by the early 1960s, around the time when the Conservative government began to fall from power, we also see these satirical reviews become so popular they began to p appear on TV. And we have programmes like That Was The Week That Was, which first appeared in 1962, just before the uh, the fall from power. So just before, just before uh, the end of the Conservative government. conservative government and we also have um, the you know the popularization of these presenters that took you know that presented these satirical shows such as David Frost became household names in this period of time so the impact of satire really did have uh, and had an effect on the attitude towards government and we'll note that we'll as we uh, move on later on in in this course we'll see that satire becomes you know uh, it becomes something that really becomes a staple of of the of the societal attitudes towards towards the government um even today and we also have the replacement of macmillan as a as a controversial um as a controversial aspect of the of, of the of the conservative government so as we've already mentioned, Macmillan retires from the Conservatives uh, as as Prime Minister retires in nineteen sixty three. Okay, and oops, and the method for which Macmillan was replaced um, was seen as an old fashioned and democratic system. Okay, the two most notable candidates and uh, most able candidates uh, in nineteen sixty three were the Chancellor R A Butler and also Lord Hailsham. These were seen as the two, um, you know, the front runners towards. Um, these were seen as the front runners. The front runners. However, in a, in a, in a, in a bout of in a bout of an undemocratic procedure, an old-fashioned procedure, uh, Douglas Hume, who wasn't actually, you know, you know, really seen as a, a popular candidate, was a pick to be the next leader. And so, as we've already talked about, Douglas Home was not really in power long enough to establish establish himself, and you know, and and, and really, you know, mark put a stamp on his legacy as prime minister before the Conservatives were replaced with a Labour government. So, in the next lesson, what we're going to do is talk about this. Uh, in the in the next few lessons, we're going to talk about the society that took place in this in this period in this sort of affluent society. We're going to talk about the economy. We're going to talk about issues of immigration, and we're going to talk about foreign policy. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the economic developments of the British economy um, during the affluent society of the Conservative governments uh, between 1951 and 1964. We're going to be taking a specific look at a number of specific policies, things like stop go, um, the policy of bookskillism, and then we're going to talk about sort of evaluating this and looking at by 1964 what really was the state of the economy during this period in time. So as we already know, as we've already touched on in the last two lessons already, uh, the period of conservative governments between uh, was between 1951 and 1964. We got to see, I believe it was four prime ministers um, during this period. We have Churchill, we have Eden, we have Macmillan, and then we have uh, Douglas Hume, Hume. And during this period, Britain saw a post-war economic boom. Okay, We saw a, you know, a very large economic growth large economic uh, 
economic growth in this period. And in this lesson, we're going to look at the, the, the policies that really stimulated this economic growth and really, um, you know, rode the back of this economic growth to, to push for further uh, changes and reform. So we're going to start by looking firstly at the policy of butskillism, which is a very interesting word to pronounce. And um, as we notice here, butskillism is a combination of the names of the Conservative Chancellor R.A. Butler and the Labour Shadow Chancellor Hugh Gateskill. So we have Butskellism. And this was an economic policy um, of trying to combine the ideas of both the Conservative and Labour parties. So we have actually quite a uh, we have quite bar bipartisan support for this. Bipartisan support. Whereas, you know, later on in in history and even today we have you know quite um stark differences between the economic policies and the social policies and you know generally all the policies between the labor and the conservative government in this period of time there was actually quite a lot of consensus we talked about consensus um in society in the last lesson so there's generally even within government there was a, an era of consensus so in terms of economic policy it wasn't really um, there wasn't much different between the Labour Party and the Conservative parties. And the aim of this Butskillism policy was to, one, maintain full employment, uh, two, to maintain economic growth, to continue the growth of the economy, uh, three, to continue the development of the welfare state, as we established the welfare state under Clement Attlee uh, in, in the previous uh, era. So Attlee following World War Two, so we have things like the welfare state, we have like the NHS, we have social protections, all these kind of things here. I think the most notable one is the NHS because, well, just because it was, uh, you know, a very, very large welfare state program and it still is today. And they also, there was also a very shared, there was a shared value on the continuation of defence commitments uh, and the development of nuclear weapons. We can see this as a, an aspect of the Cold War. So the Cold War was really ramping up at this period of time, and so um, Great Britain was, um, you know, part of this um, part of this coalition with the United States and uh, the rest of effectively NATO to develop nuclear weapons. That's not to say that all NATO members develop nuclear weapons, but this kind of East versus West within the Cold War, which we'll talk about when we talk about foreign policy. Um, was something that heavily influenced British policy. So when it comes to British economic growth, like other Western states, the British economy grew partially due to the US Marshall Plan. Now the US Marshall Plan was effectively um, just overseas investments, overseas investments to rebuild, uh, to rebuild Europe effectively, to rebuild Europe. With the implied, con that with the the implication, there's like this sort of implied notion that um, that there would be Western allies to the United States in return for these overseas investments. The U.S. doesn't necessarily um, commit to the Marshall Plan out of the kindness of their hearts. There's the general political ambition to try and um, incentivize Western states in Europe to align with the capitalist US values rather than the, the USSR. However, when it comes to looking at the period of buskalism and this sort of economic consensus, there were a number of problems that, that needed to be addressed. So, for example, Britain imported more than it exported, which means that there was a balance of payments deficit. So every single time in, an, in economics, you have more imports, more things coming in than more things being sold going out, okay, the the deficit, the balance of payments deficit would grow further and further. And if you then reverse the two roles, we have more exports than imports, then the balance of payments deficits begins to um, reduce. And by 1961, after, you know, the during the 50s and then following into the 60s the deficit grew to as high as 95 million pounds which in today's money doesn't sound like particularly very much um however for the british economy back then that was a considerable sum 
and there was also a problem of economic commitments so it was very difficult to um, commit economically to a number of different promises that were all very expensive so they were trying to build a one a competitive economy okay that had nuclear weapons and a strong welfare state all at the same time so they were trying to be competitive on the world stage economically because of the growing changing nature of the of the planet during this period of time with the emergence of superpowers like the US and uh, the USSR we also have the heavy investment in nuclear technology and the development of nuclear weapons again to stay as uh, partly to stay on top of the race to try and you know stay within that sort of top 3 that uh, when it comes to the cold war and then we also have the strong support for the welfare state which was a, a generally uh, you know generally a bipartisan support for the welfare state and there's a strong strong support for the welfare state even today but all these things were very costly and very expensive so it was difficult to try and commit to these economic um, promises all at the same time and because of this we have the idea of um, with you know in conjunction with the balance of payments problem we have the growth of inflation so we have growing inflation taking place during this period and this idea of quote stagflation grew this was the idea that as prices continued to grow um, while the economy didn't grow okay so we see that the um, the the increase in prices would outpace the increase in economic growth um, which is where this idea of stagflation uh, came about. So we have this idea of stagnation, the, the economy stagnates whilst prices inflate. So um, the British at this period of time um, had a habit of wanting to just uh, mould words together. So we've got buskalism and we've got stagflation. Uh, as a result of these issues, though, um, the British debt was increased. And in 1957, debts were around 540 million okay this had gone up by 1964 to around 800 million which is a huge considerable sum uh, for the time so for the time uh, for the time this is a lot of money this is a lot of money I've spelt money wrong there we go and uh, Generally, for to, you know, in today's standards, um, where we have a GDP of over a trillion, um, this isn't too bad. But back then, eight hundred million was a significant amount of money. Um, more on the sort of social implications of the economic policies, we have the nineteen fifty seven Harold Macmillan's famous speech. Um, Harold Macmillan um, noting that the British people quote never had it so good which is the sort of um, the economic understanding that took place. However, you know, while most historians argue that this was largely true, you know, there is no denying that there was uh, no denying denying uh, the economic prosperity during this period. The economic prosperity during this period there were issues as we have just noted when with the policy of buskalism there were definitely issues okay and there were issues with the economy more generally so for example consumer spending was mainly a, a, on the basis of credit okay while at the same time the fact that unemployment was very low was seen as a positive aspect of uh, you know of the of the british economy however it was remaining low, but it was still um, continuously moving up. It was continuously on the rise. It was increasing at a, at a steady rate. So we do have, you know, there is this historical interpretation, and that you know you'll often you could often get asked a question on uh, whether or not the British economy was very successful during this period in time. I think it's undoubtedly the case that prosperity was very very high, but you can also make clear. Um, references to all of these issues here the idea of consumer being on uh, credit consumerism the idea of employment um, gradually increasing 
We could talk about the, the growing inflation, the economic commitments problem, uh, balance of payments problem, all of these things, okay, and obviously the, the, the debt crisis. One other policy that I want to talk about before we start to, you know, um, evaluate the economy by 1964 uh, is, the, is the policy of stop-go. And this is an economic policy um, generally favoured by conservative chancellors during this period of time. Okay, so they didn't get, um, you know, wasn't significantly supported by other parties. Significantly supported by other parties. Although... You know, as I've already mentioned, the 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 sort of this period was a period of relative consensus and quite um, bipartisan politics compared to like today, for example. So, it was a way to in control economic growth by um, making um, changes to inflation rates. So the belief was that if we control inflation rates you know, slower and uh, to, to increase and decrease inflation rates, then we can control economic growth on that very uh, basis. And it's based on a very simple, pre uh, on a simple premise. So when um, growth was too fast, because economic growth can be, you know, something that happens too quickly. When economic growth was too fast, uh, the government would increase interest rates. And this means that the cost of borrowing would increase because of the in, because the increase in uh, interest rates, as a result, the price of borrowing increases, thus the re, uh, demand um, reduces. This is simple supply and demand. When the price for some for some product um, increases, the demand for that product will decrease, and vice versa. And this is exactly the same when it comes to um, the 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 cost of borrowing. If borrowing increases. Um, the cost of borrowing increases through the government's policies of interest rates, then the demand for that um, for that capital will decrease. And so, and obviously, the the converse will be true. If growth slows, the government would decrease interest rates, therefore incentivizing consumers to borrow, because the cost would be lower, thus incentivizing an increasing demand. That's the simple um, the simple approach. And despite this, when um, election year would approach, budgets were manipulated to win more and more support. Okay, and there were obviously a number of issues with the economy during this time, and with this kind of stop-go policy. There's never a, a single economic policy that is universally accepted to be, you know, the most successful. So this came to a point in 1957 when Macmillan's entire tr uh, treasury um, ministers, team of treasury ministers, resigned over measures enforcing the stop-go policy. So I'm trying to draw a straight line. This happens every every lesson. There we go. In July 1961, the government announced a pay pause in the public sector to try and curb um, excessive pay demands throughout the economy. So the, the public sector um, being, um, I'm trying to explain this in, in, in the simplest way, because you know, not everybody um, <laughs> does economics. So the public sector is the, is the you could describe, for example, um, NHS workers being in the public sector, whereas private companies, if you worked for a private company, that would be in the private sector. So government funded government pay um, can be um, paused, uh, you know, um, for public sector jobs and public sector workers. However, to try and this was to try and um, to curb demands throughout the economy, pay demands. However, following a number of threats from str of striking from electricity workers, uh, the government gave in to their demands. So, we start to see this the you know some minor cracks in economic development taking place with uh, political division over the stop-go measures we have some political division within the party so political division here in the, within the party and we also have um, um, decreased positive relationship between the government and public sector workers so when it comes to evaluating the British economy by the end of this sort of affluent period of, of conservative governments by 1964 um, the problems with the economy had become a lot more apparent Okay, this econ this this period of economic growth wasn't going 
uh, was never going to last forever. So economic growth wasn't going to last forever. Economic growth uh, was not uh, going to last forever. Forever. Okay. This should be noted. Because when it came to 1963, by 1963, un unemployment had risen to 800,000 people. Okay, um, the Chancellor Reginald Malding adopted a free spending budget to try and reduce unemployment, and he was um, also successful in uh, reducing interest rates and cutting taxes. Although um, this was successful in uh, in um, falling in the decrease in unemploy in, in um, unemployment numbers. Let me just, uh, that should say unemployment numbers. So they fell by around 300,000 in uh, 1964. This increased the deficit back to up to 800 million, as we already mentioned. So we can see that if we're going to evaluate the British economy by 1964, while there was very prosperous and very successful during these periods due to things like buskerism uh, and stop-go policies, uh, the cracks were starting to show. And we are starting to see these these um, problems that um, might particularly be quite minor, you know, in relation to each other, but were beginning to have a, a greater, larger detrimental impact on the economy. And in the next lesson, we're going to talk about societal issues during this period of time before we move on to talk about the foreign policy objectives that took place as well. In this video, I want to talk about society within the period of time of conservative government in uh, sorry following the second world war so in the last video we talked about the economic situation the way in which the economy was ordered during this period and today we're going to talk about the way in which society was um, you know the societal developments okay so if i just change the color real quick there we go so i'm also going to just turn this off right so we're talking about societal developments so societal developments and we're going to focus on three specific areas we're going to focus on living standards we're going to focus on the position of women within society and we're going to look at the uh, impact of class and class struggle within society so first from living standards as we've already mentioned in earlier videos the 1950s saw some of the best growth in living standards for a very long time that's why it was described as the affluent society the affluent society okay and there was the the you know the speech by the prime minister i believe prime minister macmillan who was who suggested that you know we've never had it so good so this is one of the things that is very important. We have this sort of affluent uh, living standards within society. And we saw we see a period of history which was marked by economic consumerism. So the, so the economic developments that took place that we looked at in the last lesson were sort of marking the um, sort of marked the uh, people's um, people's societal interests and the societal developments that took place so people would purchase items and pay them off with weekly installments okay so we're gonna this is uh, purchasing through credit this was a, a sort of a new phenomenon that took place and it meant that effectively people were able to purchase more things okay so it led to um, you know being able to to buy more things because because if you have a system uh, where you have to purchase in a lump sum, you have to purchase something like we normally would purchase something today, where you just, for example, a, a car, okay? Um, you would, you know, or actually less so, a laptop. Let's talk about a laptop. Um, where you would have to, you know, save the money first and then purchase, um, you know, f full price of the laptop. Back in, you know, back in the 1950s, this sort of, this sort of idea of being able to, um, you know, put down um, a certain amount of money and then get the item straight away, and then be able to pay off the rest of the item using, you know, weekly or monthly instalments. It meant that people were able to um, purchase more things uh, and quickly purchase more things. So it led to a growth of consumer ownership. So people were owning more and more um, items. And an example of this is in the car, uh, the car market. So 
um, car ownership went from 3 million to 7 million in the 1950s. So this is in the 1950s. In the 1950s. Which is incredibly important. One of the biggest changes in society in terms of the consumer ownership, you know, owning um, different products, and also within the uh, also within the system of um, societal developments, the way culture changed was when it comes to the number of televisions that were bought. So TV ownership went from 340,000 in 1951 at the start of the 1950s and by 1963 towards the end of conservative government, so towards the end of conservative government, okay, towards the end of conservative government, we see an increase from 340,000 to over 50, sorry, for over 13 million. Okay, so we see a very large increase in consumer ownership and ownership of televisions. And this TV ownership changes the um, cultural developments that take place as well. Because this culture, uh, you know, because um, the, the ability for people to um, uh, have access to popular culture like television programs um, is, is greatly increased with the number of televisions that are being sold. When we talk about specific societal groups, uh, we're going to talk about other types, uh, other uh, other groups within society in later videos, as um, you know, civil rights uh, and racial discrimination, as well as LGBT discrimination, becomes more of an issue and more of a a problem that needs to be solved in the in society in, in Britain. But for now, we're going to talk about women in society, and position of women in society was particularly limited, despite the fact we have this period of affluence. Okay, despite the period of affluence, in fact, despite the period of affluence of affluence. Okay, now, of course, at this period of time, there was a huge gender pay gap of up to 40%, which meant that two uh, people, a man and a woman, okay, doing the exact same job the woman will be paid 40 percent less now we still have um in, you know there are still sectors in society where there's a pay gap today however um you know legislation has changed to make sure that you know equal pay is 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 provided for 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 different um for men and women equally but this happened in the 70s in education as well, uh, women were often passed up for men when it came to things like university places. So there was a lot of um, general sexism within the education system. And this is expressed through the evidence that we have that in the 1950s, okay, in the period of the 1950s, only around 2% of girls went to university. Okay, So it was a 98%, um, so you know, 2% of all girls within society um, had a university degree. However, despite the fact that these are arguably, you know, quite um, limited um, societal developments, okay, we see a, a sort of the sort of winds of change as there are signs of some changes um, coming into the late 1950s. So in the late 1950s, we see things like equal pay being introduced in the civil service. So this was something that took place in 1958. And we also see a number of women's organisations with uh, organising um, different, um, you know, political, um, uh, you know, organising for different political goals. People like Dora Russell, who um, organised a peace caravan to protect against nuclear weapons. So we're starting to see the role of women in politics also change. So this involves the you know, sort of role of women in politics. Role of women in politics. Now, of course, this is going to be a period of time where women in politics um, grows more and more as a concept. And, you know, as we get towards the Thatcher years, OK, we start to see more and more women and um, the role of women within political movements become more and more apparent. However, what should be noted about the affluent society in, in terms of the role of the women played was that despite there being a lot of limitations okay you could you could really go back and forth in an essay question when we're talking about the limitations but towards the end of the 1950s towards the end of the conservative period uh, you know 1958 is a good example we start to see things like equal pay being introduced uh, more political activism amongst um, women 
The final thing I want to talk about is the um, influence of class in society, because class still played an incredibly um, important role and an incredibly influential role of British society. It was still ingrained into the societal structure, as it, as arguably it is today. So most of the Conservative Party was often white, well-off, upper-class men. Okay, so a very distinct class of characters. So a, a very um, a clear, a clear class. Uh, of, of people that's what we see here it's a very specific and very uh, and, and actually compared to the rest of the society it was actually quite a small uh, minority of society you know there were more um, uh, men women um, you know people of um, different uh, racial backgrounds okay uh, people of different ages younger people as well but they were not represented in, in government especially within the conservative party we have often very white, very well-off, uh, very upper-class on, only men, generally, within within the Conservative Party. And as we talked about in the video on Conservative Decline, this sort of made the Conservative Party look a little bit more out of touch. And this sort of idea that the Conservative Party were out of touch uh, began to develop more and more as we see the various scandals that take place uh, that we talked about in the Conservative Decline video. However, again... There were still signs of change, despite the fact that we have um, a very highly influential um, class structure within uh, within Britain at this time. The f and there are a number of reasons why that there is this kind of change within within class. And the first reason is obviously the impact of the Second World War. The so the kind of class divide that takes place in society sort of comes people come together when you have to fight a world war and you have this sort of sense of all being all in it together it didn't actually matter anymore which which you know which class you were a part of if you were upper class or lower class if you're both fighting in the same place on the same battlefield so that's the kind of the kind of influence that world war Two had on the on the class structure in in britain we also have things like the creation of a welfare state and the creation of the, you know, the creation of the NHS. This was something that was done under Clement Attlee, um, under the Labour government that took over just after Winston Churchill won, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, just after Winston Churchill lost the election in 1946. This led to improvements in living standards, okay, and these living standards, uh, this improvement in living standards raised the expectation of the lower classes of the lower classes so now that there was this there was less of a divide or the divide was beginning to shrink whereby with the introduction of a welfare state and an nhs and, and all, all other kinds of um of welfare support the lower classes okay um were bolstered up uh, ever so slightly and so their in expectations for um f for society effectively um, increased as well and that closed the class divide a little bit this point above that we've just talked about here when we talk about the welfare state also um, applies to the genuine um, genuine um, general growing of affluence experienced in this period. Don't forget again, this was a, a period of economic growth and prosperity. So we have economic, economic growth and prosperity. And generally speaking, even though there's a, a a division of wealth and there's a division in class if there's overall economic growth and prosperity that has a positive impact on everybody okay it might impact the upper classes a lot more that they might make more money than the lower classes still and there might still be this divide but it brings the whole ship up if that makes sense and there was also uh, another part that um you know um something that also closed the class divide and this is the idea of the sort of satirical comedy that took place and the increase in scandals uh, amongst the conservative upper class okay amongst the conservative upper class conservative upper class it uh, you know led to a decline in the, in this kind of deference towards this group and it sort of burst the bubble effectively okay so you have this um very um noble um white well-off upper class um group of men that are in the conservative party and the fact that they have affairs and that we can take the mick out of them using um, satirical skits um 
it sort of bursts the bubble, this illusion that they are this upper nobility and this and this almost royalty kind of impression that is given towards the upper classes. Um, they are brought down to the level of the rest of us um, by you know being involved in these different kinds of scandals. So as we can see, society was still had it still had a number of issues. Living standards undoubtedly increased due to the idea of, um, you know, basically effectively economic prosperity leading to consumerism and consumer ownership. And that all led to an increase generally in living standards across the board, effectively. However, there were still areas where society um, was relatively stagnant. So things like society when it comes to women and we're talking about class in society, women were still um, seen as a, a lower uh, as seen as a lower class in terms of um, their position in society with huge gender pay gaps with the impression that they are not um, gonna you know pursue a, a life a career in education and go to university etc however at the same time we still see the winds of change we still see things like towards the end of the 1950s introduce introduction of some equal pay rules and we start to see um, women um, increase in their political participation with the likes of Dora Russell for example and the same thing for class while class was still a hugely important um, part of society that was ingrained within society and while there was still a huge class divide a number of things like World War Two and the welfare state and the you know the influence of satire um, sort of closed that divide ever so slightly in the next video we're going to talk about more the kind of social tensions that took place including racial tensions the impact of immigration etc before we move on to look at foreign policy so in the last lesson we looked at the social structures that existed within this period in, in history within the affluent society and what we're going to do in this lesson is have a look at the social tensions that existed because despite the fact that economically the affluent society was very economically stable okay it was uh, very prosperous as well prosperous despite all this there were so some social tensions and social tensions during this period can be divided really into two camps we could talk about areas of race relations something that will pay uh, play a key role within british uh, within british society for a very long time to come as well and also attitudes to one towards young people and that's what we're going to do here we're going to talk about each of them individually so we're going to start by looking at race relations and really the issues of race relations um, are centered around the issues of immigration immigration and race relations have always um, played a key role and they also um, act hand in hand with each other so due to labour shortages, people from the new Commonwealth, the new Commonwealth being the um, newly decolonised um, countries that were previously part of the British Empire, the people from the new Commonwealth were encouraged to move to Britain. Okay, And these were places like India, Pakistan and places in the Caribbean. So these are all former colonies. So these are uh, former colonies. Former colonies. And obviously, because these are different people from around the world with different, um, you know, of different race, different ethnicities, um, different national backgrounds, different cultures, this influx of new people from all these different areas across the world, okay, um, these people began to um, congregate almost in communities around industry. So around different industries. And this is because obviously they were encouraged to come due to labour shortages. And um, very often the cliche and the um, the statistics that are that that we see is that Asian communities would often become centered around the textile areas in the northern towns, okay, and then uh, Asian and Caribbean communities were focused around areas of heavy industry, um, so more so in more urban environments, so in more urban environments in you know in the bigger cities, and of course, London was a a center almost a hub for um, lots of different cultures and um, different um, groups of people from all over the world moved into London it became a very culturally and ethnically diverse place and of course um, you know 
uh, like with any period in society, when there is an influx of new people from from a different part of the world, um, there comes um, a certain state of racism and discrimination against these people. And when it comes to looking at the figures, um, there was undoubtedly a, an increase in immigration in this period of time. OK, so people, um, you know, the, the general racism and discrimination can be explained through the increase in immigration figures. So, for example, between 1940 and 1949, the number of immigrants moving into the United Kingdom was around 240,000. So this is obviously, they're always an estimate. So around, so around 240,000. However, between 1960 and 1970, I should say, <laughs> between 1960 and 1960, no, between 1960 and 1970, um, immigration numbers increased to 1.2 million. So in a similar time frame, a similar 10 years, okay, there was around 1.2 million, so nearly a million more people um, in, immigrated into the United Kingdom in this period of time. So this is again just an estimate. Just, just an estimate. And obviously this influx in immigration and this influx in, in new people from different cultures led to different shifts in, in cultural characteristics in, in society and so therefore we have a, a growth of racism and discrimination which then leads to racial violence. Now in 1958 uh, there was a series of racial attacks in cities such as Nottingham, uh, London uh, on August bank holiday. Okay. Uh, this was, uh, you know, this was just one of the um, attacks um, that are, were race related. TV news coverage drew more attention to this issue and a subsequent inquiry found that the tensions were generally just the result of the cultural differences and the pressure on the availability of accommodation. Because generally speaking, when there is an influx of new people coming in, this sometimes has a a, a, a slight negative effect um, on, on on low income um, labor markets so on unskilled workers that tends to have a slight um, decrease in pay in that in that in that area and it sometimes also has um, issues when you have already um, pressure on accommodation and other kind of social services uh, which you have more people coming in then this um, increases the pressure as well and like I said, uh, increase in immigration leads to increase in racism, which leads to increase in racial violence. So when it comes to um, the legal regime that existed in this period of time, when it came to the, the legal regime um, governing the, um, the influx of, of Commonwealth citizens into, into the United Kingdom, um, effectively the existing law gave Commonwealth citizens the right to citizenship and residence in Great Britain. And this was obviously um, something that was very, um, very attractive. This was very attractive to um, people who were living in, 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 in more developing areas in the world and wanted to move into this very highly industrialized, high paying area, especially with the economic prosperity that was taking place as well. And so as a result of that, in 1962, um, we have the passing of the Commonwealth Immigration Act. And what the Commonwealth Immigration Act did try to um, respond to some of these um, problems when it came to racism and discrimination by placing some limitations on uh, on on uh, on Commonwealth citizens being able to move in into the United Kingdom. So, for one, immigrants must have had a job, so they must have uh, already guaranteed uh, work. So, they must have guaranteed guaranteed work. And they had to have particular skills, so it was often skilled, uh, skilled labour, skilled labour. So that meant that people who were unskilled and didn't have a job couldn't come over here and um, and try to find a job uh, when they get here um, in an unskilled labour market. They would have to have a skill. They had to be in a skilled labour market. Have to have a particular. Um, you know whatever skill that might be and they must must already have a job before they enter so this did place limitations of course when we talk about young people in society there were also 
um, there was also a a, a, a a tension that took place um, within the, the social structure um, when it came to youth culture. So the post-war years has seen a large number of births. Okay, it became the baby boom generation or the baby boomer generation. Okay, and by the 1950s, these young people that were being born immediately after the Second World War uh, were growing up uh, and developing their own youth culture. So the cultural changes began to shift in this period of time. The cultural changes from um, after from after the Second World War, immediately after the Second World War, into the 1950s and, and the early 1960s. Okay, these cultures were cemented by the fact that there was often low unemployment. Okay, so all of these young people had jobs and therefore they had disposable incomes. So this is obviously the the fact that there's low unemployment is due to the uh, economic prosperity as we've already talked about in previous lessons economic prosperity prosperity and the post-war boom post-war boom and as you can tell it's very important that you are able to understand the the relationship that economics plays with societal um, factors so the fact that these young people developed a youth culture can largely be um, attributed to the fact that they had disposable incomes due to the fact that they all had jobs and this was something that was a result of low unemployment because of economic policies and the sort of general post-war boom that was going to happen anyway um, following the second world war so the economics um, almost plays into um, how the um, social cultures develop with this uh, youth culture came um, groups known as teddy boys and these were identified by their slick black hair and their sort of Edwardian style suits. They were often violent and they had very little respect for elder people. And the results of this show when there's an increase in vice, uh, vandalisms uh, and racial attacks on immigrants. So this also had uh, played a racial factor. OK, so youth culture. Youth culture. Also had also had a, a racial factor so don't forget that these two um, these two developing tensions that took place within society are not uh, you shouldn't be able to view them in a vacuum okay the youth culture uh, played a part in the uh, racial violence that took place and just like that the immigration policy and immigration legislation played a part in the youth culture's um, discrimination against these new people coming into into the United Kingdom. So as we can see, there is um, a significant amount of racial uh, and uh, youth tension within society when we're talking about this period of time, despite the fact that there was um, quite a lot of economic stability. In the next lesson, what we're going to do is look at um, the foreign policy, because don't forget we have... Um, quite a quite a quite a um, uh, quite an invigorated um, foreign uh, international relations um, scene going on um, following the second world war with the creation of the united nations and with the um, beginnings of the the cold war uh, specifically the cold war in in europe